Great. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Quentin Wadon, and I've been given uh, three, four minutes to introduce this uh, webinar on ending the violence of extreme poverty. Um, please uh, mute yourselves uh, while uh, we are going to watch the uh, documentary and also when we will have um, the speakers. And uh, you can uh, unmute yourself uh, and raise your hand to ask a question. So you can also ask uh, questions through the chat. Uh, we hope that we will um, manage to have the webinar uh, done within an hour and a half. And we have an extremely interesting program, at least I think so. Um, uh, before introducing the program, uh, I should uh, mention the sponsors and uh, the person who had the idea for uh, this program. So first, the sponsors. Uh, we have four main sponsors for uh, this webinar. Uh, the first is the Rotary Peace Fellows Alumni Association. And uh, I think most of you are Rotarians. Uh, you probably know about the Peace Fellows program. Um, Rotary has uh, funded uh, more than 1,000 uh, peace fellows over the last 15 years or so um, who are doing great work. Um, one of them, um, among many others, is uh, Spencer Leung, and he is the one who actually suggested this webinar. Um, let me just mention briefly uh, his bio. Uh, he was born and raised in Hong Kong. Uh, he's based in Bangkok. Uh, and, and we managed to, to try to find a time uh, that was working for folks in Bangkok, as well as some folks from California, where it's very early in the morning. Um, in 2015, uh, Spencer graduated from the Peace Fellow program, and he set up a social enterprise in Thailand, uh, focusing on supporting smallholder farmers, uh, trying to move them towards um, sustainable organic farming. So his enterprise works with hotels, restaurants, families, individuals, and others and uh, trying to create an effective marketplace uh, for farmers in selling uh, their produce. So um, last year, uh, he founded Geo Organics Peace International, a nonprofit organization based in Hong Kong uh, to promote uh, those goals. Um, what I do want to say, which is a bit different uh, for those who have participated in some of our webinars, uh, but this is actually the idea from the Peace Fellows Association, is that we will have a documentary first, uh, and then we will have the panel. And so uh, it will be actually very interesting uh, to hear from you whether you find uh, this uh, formula um, interesting. Now, apart from the Rotary Peace Fellows Alumni Association, we have uh, three other sponsors for the webinar. Uh, we have the Rotary Club of Washington Global, uh, the new Rotary Fellowship on Global Development, and the Rotary Action Group on Refugees, uh, Forced Displacement and Migration. Now, I know that probably a, a good number of those online right now uh, know about uh, those organizations. I, I won't introduce them uh, in any details. Um, just letting you know that uh, we are progressing, uh, and in particular, for those who do not know, the Rotary Action Group um, on Refugees, for Displacement and Migration was approved uh, by the Board of Rotary International at the end of November. So uh, now we are moving full speed on setting up the website um, and other things. So um, today uh, we are going to have uh, that documentary and then we are going to have the speakers. Um, before introducing the speakers, um, and I realize I'm taking a few more minutes than I should perhaps, but I, I just want to say um, that um, uh, this uh, program is in large part about ATD Fourth World, um, which is an organization I, I, I really highly respect. I, I actually worked for the organizations for a few years. It was founded by a Catholic priest, but it's not uh, a confessional organization. Um, it's not religious. And um, it's doing extraordinary work um, in uh, working with people in extreme poverty uh, all around the world. Uh, now, we have um, uh, two speakers uh, from the organization uh, and then uh, a third one from, from an, uh, another organization which works with um, ATD Fourth World. Um, so the first speaker, um, or I don't know in which uh, order Mini will uh, introduce them, but the, um, Marianne Broxton has been an activist with ATD Fourth World uh, for about six years, and she was a coordinator for the US of a study uh, about the multidimensional aspects of poverty. Uh, this is participatory research, uh, and that study actually um, is, is starting it's to read out. Uh, she holds a BA from Lesley University in Cambridge, and she draws on her own experience of poverty um, as a single mother.
to explore best practices in setting conditions for others to work with people in poverty. Um, uh, so she has presented um, some of her work and experiences in, in multiple um, uh, venues, including at the UN and uh, some uh, research centers in the US. Um, our second speaker will be Tony Lowe, uh, who is the executive director of ATD Fourth World Asia. And after graduating from the Asian Institute of Management uh, with a master's degree in management, he joined the Fourth World Movement in 1993. Um, he has been with uh, the organization in Geneva, uh, collaborating with UN agencies, NGOs, and governmental institutions uh, to try to make sure that the basic rights of families in extreme poverty are recognized. And he also worked um, in the UK uh, in the Frimhurst Family Center, uh, which is a very interesting project uh, that provides uh, respite for families uh, in persistent poverty. Um, the third speaker is Lennon Ramahan, Rama, Rahman, sorry. Uh, he's the founder and executive director of Mati Bangladesh and Mati EV Germany. Uh, he studied at Dhaka University on political sciences and social welfare, and then um, went to do civil engineering um, at the University of Germany. Uh, while he was still a student, he founded uh, his organization. And the following year, uh, Mati Bangladesh, first in Germany, then in Bangladesh. And his organization specializes in poverty reduction, women empowerment, and human rights, uh, trying to um, uh, implement and, and develop projects that are based on um, the community um, uh, priorities. Now, we have also uh, Rukmini uh, Ayer, or Mini, um, and uh, she will be moderating the panel after the documentary. Uh, she's a peace builder and leadership development consultant uh, for more than two decades. Uh, she has worked with corporate organizations around the world uh, through consulting, coaching, facilitation, um, to try to engage them with uh, conscious capitalism. Um, so she, uh, as a peace builder, uh, focuses on peace education and dialogue-based work. Um, she is also a Rotary Peace Fellow from uh, Chula Longkorn uh, University. So I think I've gone through um, all of our speakers. Um, what we are going to do um, is uh, play the video. Uh, it's about 27 minutes. Um, Spencer will launch it uh, is just one minute. After the video, uh, Mini will uh, take up the management of the webinar and uh, have a dialogue with the speakers and we will make sure that we have 10, 15 minutes at the end for question and answer. Spencer, uh, please go ahead. And thank you everybody again for joining. We hope you will enjoy. Initiated by ATD Fourth World, during a three year period, over 1,000 people on five continents were able to share their pain, their resistance and their initiatives to the violence of extreme poverty which they endure on a daily basis. They were able to merge their knowledge with other relevant professionals, <coughs> academics and public policy makers. A number of them came together to draw up conclusions and make proposals during a seminar at ATD Fourth World's International Centre and also at the UNESCO in Paris. We are neither recognized nor treated as human beings. As Hurricane Katrina approached New Orleans in the USA, the guards at a prison locked the prisoners in their cells and then left. When the dams broke, the waters rose. The men heard the flood coming and the water rose higher in their cells. They climbed onto the bunk beds, sure someone would come for them, but no one came. As soon as we had arrived, they told us that we would be evicted because our presence was a blight on the town. The town had banned us from settling down, but I asked what they were going to do with all these very poor people. Why don't you want us to settle here? We will not threaten public safety. Rather, we will reinforce it. So, the town finally agreed. Just the fact of looking at pictures in books develops the minds of our children.
In the end, we were chased away so that the train company, Matarail, could recover the site. They put us in a quarry. They told us they would come and help us and to be patient. But after a while, we had not eaten for two weeks. You were not allowed to leave. There were guards on the gates, and those who left were noted down. We spent over a year in that hole, even though we were meant to stay for only three months. And after a year, they came and picked us up at 4 a.m. And you were moved to Carrefou? That is where we really suffered. We did not even have the means to bury our dead. The sick had no one to care for them. The dead were without coffins. We asked ourselves what should we do, and finally, we decided to leave. Upon our arrival here, the landowners of the village complained and told us we could not salvage material at the landfill. When the mayor arrived, he said we could no longer build houses here, that we had to gather up our belongings and leave right away. I said that these people are not thieves because I am the one who brought them here. He said I was responsible for these people. We went over there and gathered signatures to sponsor the people. We did not have the right to build, but we were still allowed to build houses in the water where the rice fields were located. I never stopped defending the cause of these families within the village committee, saying that these people are men not animals. I have six children and 13 grandchildren. I was a good mother, even though people made me feel I wasn't. I was discriminated against, and it was very hard for me to give up my home and to go where people wouldn't treat me badly. Because I've lived alone all my life, and I've always had to leave my children to go to work and allow them to go to school. In order for them to be good people in the future, and so that they don't let anyone humiliate them like people often did to me. Due to the violence in my country, I lost a 15-year-old son and we never found his body. If I had just stayed at home, crying about what had happened to me, Maybe today I would already be dead. In my opinion, staying alone, with just your grief, and without talking about it, with anyone, is the worst thing to do. When people treat you like that, this continual provocation infuriates you and makes you want to respond to the other's contempt, to want to respond to the other's violence. I work in an organization that tries to support children and youth living on the street. I had the opportunity to support a child whose leg was fractured. He was kept for three days in hospital. I had to keep following the doctor from room to room. If I had not been there, his leg wouldn't have been put in plaster. Many young people do not dare go to health centers because they are looked down on. And if in addition they do not have the necessary means and are not accompanied, then they're not acknowledged or treated. I have met many people who suffered from not being able to support their families. There are fathers, when night approaches, 
They have heavy hearts because they know they will go home empty-handed. They suffer in silence in their family. During the seminar, we visited a cemetery that had, like most cemeteries in the UK, an area where the destitute poor are buried. There were no gravestones, no names, nothing to show who lay there. In death as in life, the poor had become nothing, as if they had never existed. I was put into a children's home when I was two and a half years old. I was surrounded by violence. It wasn't my choice. Being in the children's home meant we missed out on a lot of things. Most are dead or in prison. It's hard when you've been badly treated from a young age. And very difficult to get over it. Because nobody explains what's happening. No one tells you anything. Services, but nothing's explained. Nobody helps you. Nobody's going to find you a flat or somewhere to live or anything. They tell you to go to the homeless shelter where you'll be with people who are just as badly off as you. I was homeless for three years. I slept in factories, abandoned houses, anywhere. I had to beg for food. Three years like that. No security. I had nothing. I managed to get through it. I got my daughter a house. I'm not that badly off. La difficulté, c'est tous ces pauvres gens que. The problem is all the people we don't know who live in poverty. Et qui chaque jour We're struggling to survive every day. Bien sûr, quand on se retrouve au chômage. Of course, it's really hard when you lose your job. Lots of people I used to know are living in the streets now. That's really hard too. Alors, où est la beauté? Where's the beauty in all that? There isn't any. Just people who used to have a job and don't have anything anymore. In Senegal, there is the issue of not being able to register children at birth. When a woman goes to give birth, she has to pay. When she can't pay, the health centre keeps the birth records. If you don't have the birth records, you can't register the birth with the authorities. These children can never go to school, can't get an ID, can't vote. If you ask me, it's like denying that they even exist. In one of the neighbourhoods where we go, it took three years of work to prove that families wanted to enrol their children in school, but that it takes a lot of preparation work beforehand, such as birth certificates. This year, after a long process, we managed to convince the school to reopen classes where families could pay little by little. It's been so successful that the head teacher told me that the school will no longer be a community school next year, but a private school. We know that the families the classes were reopened for won't be able to send their children there. For me, it's an extreme violence, 
to say to someone, you fought to make the school successful, but now that it is, you're going to be left behind. No time is taken to get to know the neighbourhood, to understand what the family's lives are like. This means that many families in the neighbourhood are left out. <coughs> in Anoska, today, 85% of parents neither know how to read or write. Someone always has to go with them to take care of administrative matters. When they have to put their thumbprint without knowing what was written on the paper, it's violence. When we love I lived through the violence of extreme poverty when people ignored my family and me. The hardest thing was the way people looked at you. I can give you the example of the school my little sister went to. She's so shocked that she's afraid to go to school because teachers tell her that she's an incompetent girl, that she'll never succeed in anything. They always make her sit in the back of the classroom. Parents have a hard time sending their children to school on an empty stomach. Some parents are angry and they wonder why the teachers make their children sit in the back. And my other children make fun of them, saying, you don't know how to learn, that's why you have to sit at the back. But children know how to think and they realize that this isn't normal. They say as much using their own words, but the teacher doesn't listen. Some people can't talk about the things they've lived through because it's too hard to talk about things they've done to you. No, on se met pas en colère. La colère est comme un silence. No, we don't get openly angry. Our anger is silent. La colère, elle est là. And it's deep inside us. Donc, c'est-à-dire, il n'y a pas d'agressivité, il n'y a pas tout ça. So there's no outward aggression or anything like that. We are so fed up that we can't even show our anger. So there's just silence. Silence is like the dark. Et pourtant, on aimerait voir le jour. We'd like to see a light at the end of the tunnel. Mais on est tellement épuisé. But we are so tired of fighting that we give up trying. We still feel strong, though. I came to this community because of the genocide that exterminated and mistreated a whole ethnic group. I was being pursued. This community was considered as a second-class zone, forgotten by all. But ATD brought us together without making any differences. It was like they were our mediator. When people have problems between themselves, ATD social workers visit their families. They comfort those who lost everything during the genocide. Those who participated in the genocide, they tell them that this was a misfortune that fell on the country, that it wasn't an idea that came from their heart but a law that came from the authorities, that they must reconcile with each other so that they can live as brothers and sisters. The person who has this kind of heart, if we find him and approach him, we can give him advice and he can change because we are close to him. When I got to know ATD Fourth World, I was shy and didn't talk to others. I didn't share my pain. I understood the pain of others, but couldn't tell them to express it either because I didn't know how to. But with the knowledge I gained at ATD, 
I learnt to give support, to help my neighbours, and especially my friends and my children. So we also heard from people from all over the world how they couldn't say what they felt, how they couldn't be a part of decision-making because nobody thought they had anything to contribute. When you can't even say what you think and feel, it damages you, it hurts you. And damaged people living together become a damaged community, becomes a damaged society. You ask about peace, but you've got to solve the problem of extreme poverty. Because as long as there's extreme poverty, you will never have peace. There was a mobile home under the bridge. There was a family of gypsies who lived there. Every couple of days, the police came to evict them, because these types of people are driven away by everyone. Now they have a home. I knew them when they lived a bit further down. So I carried on speaking to them when they moved under the bridge. Did many people talk to them? No. No, just me and um, Michel. People treat you differently just because you talk to people like that. If you help someone, you bring violence on yourself. I look for peace through others, inner peace especially, which I don't have in me, because everything I have experienced comes up to the surface, being torn from my parents, from my own family, from my brothers and sisters, being prevented from seeing each other. The state did us a lot of harm. It has a duty towards us, but doesn't want to admit it. It is up to them to make the first step. The movement helps me to understand how I can try to progress, to try and speak more calmly and say fairer things without losing my temper with the social services, the state and all that. It's not a good image to give to your children when they see their mother angry and exasperated. It's not an example that I want to show them. For me, peace means being safe in my family, joy and especially togetherness. That's what helps us fight. And if I personally give up, my family is going to give up too. For us to have peace, the way people see us has to change. I personally think that you have to know us before judging us. My village is a rehousing village. When we came, everyone was able to have a house, but everybody was scattered around. Everyone goes back home and doesn't know their neighbours, and the community centre is closed. It took me three years to rebuild this solidarity. We can't just speak about peace if we don't mean it. It has to be in our hearts. In an Oscar, I don't think straight away of my sister or my mum. I try to treat everyone the same. I was already poor in my neighbourhood. I was living in extreme poverty. What I want to share with others is what we can do together for the village. We find out a lot of things through education, and each time I meet a child, I try to explain this to him. I know that families were motivated by this workshop. It helped them find a bit of peace, because we could share what we learned, what we discussed, with our families. We exchanged our good and bad experiences. Managing to be together in a community is already a great success and a source of strength.
because one person alone cannot think properly. You know, with the genocide we had, there are loads of people without housing. I came to help out because I myself was very much alone during 12 years. When you are no longer alone, anything is possible. Solidarity allows you to find your intelligence once again. You calm down. You live more peacefully with others. My drops of sweat in my neighbor's field speaks louder than any words. In the penal camp, where I stayed for a long time, we experienced extreme violence. But nevertheless, we were conscious that we were in it together. We started to support each other and teach those who cannot read to read, do theatre, sculpture and gardening. When you realize that you too can do something good, then it causes you to raise your head, to feel human again. For me, peace is to live one's life without having to tread on anyone and without being trod on by anyone else. If we take the weakest in society into consideration, then we cannot but build peace, because they would be at the heart of all our projects. Now, the time has come to break the silence. If we remain silent at this time, I think it is a crime. Now, the moment to speak, the moment to raise our voices has arrived. Comment pouvons-nous honorer le courage how can we honor the infinite courage of those who are imprisoned, surrounded by extreme poverty, and who find the strength, night and day, to find ways to speak together, to build peace? All these parents who spend nights negotiating with desperate young people, and we never hear a word about this on television. And we owe it to people like those living in Haiti, humiliated and at the mercy of international aid, an aid run by managers who believe that just because they're bringing in funding, they do not need to think together with the Haitian people. La paix, elle va commencer le jour... You'll have peace when you realize that the person opposite you is the same as you, a human being to be respected. Un être humain à respecter. Then you'll have peace. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, and for those of you who joined in after the documentary began, welcome to the webinar. And if you've not done so already, feel free to introduce yourself in the chat box. Tell us who you are and where you're joining us from. My name is uh, Rukmini Ayer. I'm joining you from Mumbai in India, and uh, I'll be the moderator for the panel discussion that follows. Uh, and I'm a Rotary Peace Fellow. 
I understand that the documentary we saw may have uh, brought up some feelings, some questions. There's already a thriving conversation going on in the chat. Uh, so feel free to add in uh, your perspectives and comment. And as we go along and hear our speakers, if there are questions that come up uh, for you in the process, please do put them up on chat and uh, we will attempt to weave in the question in the conversation as we go along. Uh, Quentin's, of course, already introduced uh, our panelists. Uh, we have Tony and Marianne representing ATD Fourth World, and we have Lennon from a partner organization called Marty. And uh, for those of us who missed the introduction, we will, of course, get to know more about them as they share about their work. So, uh, Tony, let me get started with you. Uh, while you are uh, the executive director for ATD in Asia, you've also worked in several other parts of the world. Uh, based on your work, would you be able to share with us uh, some evidences that you have seen where extreme poverty is violent? Yes, um, thank you, uh, Rumini, and uh, hello, everybody. Um, first, I would like to thank the various uh, Rotarian clubs for organizing this dialogue on the theme of ending the violence of extreme poverty. And also to the other panelists, uh, Marianne and Lennon, for their work and how through their commitment and courage have enabled others to join them to be a voice for those who are suffering in extreme poverty. Um, very often when we talk of violence, we tend perhaps to think of uh, domestic violence, gender-based violence, ethnic conflicts, and war. Uh, however, as seen from the video, extreme poverty is also a form of violence, a hidden form of violence, but it's just as destructive to the men, women, and children who are living it. Um, in the video, Michelle from Belgium mentioned that the silence is like the dark and the poor would like to see the light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, let me share with you a personal experience. About 30 years ago, when uh, where I was studying for my master at the Institute, Asian Institute of Management in Manila, I was also helping out uh, occasionally in my free time a poor community doing street libraries and festivals of learning, whereby we volunteers would organize creative activities for the families and especially for the children. So during these activities or workshops, uh, we would touch on certain themes like family, your neighborhood, sports, and also peace. I still remember the words of a little girl when she was asked, what does peace mean to you? And she replied that for her, peace is to have a window so that she could see the light outside. But a bit surprised. <laughs> um, because you see, she lived in one of those shanty houses under traffic breaches in the dark. For the lucky ones uh, close to the opening of the bridge, there are opportunities to see the light of day. For others like her, they were stuck living in the dark. Their derelict homes built on top, stagnant water choked with litter and refuse. The constant sound of the rumble of traffic overhead because the ceiling is in fact the underbelly of the overhead highway. Uh, for me, that's violence. Her words um, have stayed with me ever since that time. Um, therefore, I believe that it is important, the voice of that little girl in the Philippines, Michelle from Belgium, as well as millions who suffer in silence because they were poor should be heard. Uh, this violence should be overcome. Um, let me just may maybe mention quickly another example of this uh, young couple uh, who were li living on social benefits 
in the United Kingdom and who were expecting a baby and they wanted to keep the unborn baby, unborn child. However, they were afraid that social services would take the child away because you see before they had a child before put into care when they were young and uh, they had no experience of taking care of a child. And we knew, we knew them quite well. And I, I remember you know, going to visit them very well, uh, quite often. And um, I, don't I didn't find them abusive, not at all. So we tried, our team uh, work, uh, tried to work with them and social services. We also asked another family which, of children to support them. And we told social services that we would provide the support needed for the child to be with the couple. However, despite everything that we tried, the child was taken away. The reason given was neglect. How social services was afraid because of uh, isolated cases of child neglect highlighted in tabloid newspaper. That for me is violence. Yeah, yeah, thank you for expanding on the definition of violence for us, uh, Tony, that that really lays the ground for further discussion. And uh, Mary, and I'm, I'm curious to hear your perspective, given that you, you head up the MAP research project and you've looked at various dimensions of poverty and how how it works up to violence. So would you like to add? Hey, to um, first, thank you. Yes, please. And first, I'd like to say thank you for inviting me to the conversation. And thank you to the panelists and the sponsors. Um, a lot of what was said in the video is the same things that we heard in the research that we did in the United States in six different locations in both rural and urban areas. And what stood out to me, it was like oh, the most when I, when I first watched this video, is that the gentleman said we suffer in silence. And that's the exact same thing that a man living in Harlem, New York, described his experience of poverty. And he never saw this video. He never like heard a met this man. They will live a world apart, but they yet describe it the same exact way. Um, example I wanna offer is not for my direct work with AT Fourth World, but I think it il illustrates poverty as violence perfectly. Um, in April of last year, so 2020, as COVID began spreading across the US, the question of how to prevent the spread in congregate settings became a huge concern. And in Las Vegas, Nevada, um, to prevent the outbreak in, lo in a local homeless shelter, it was decided to have people experiencing homelessness sleep in a six by six foot area mocked out on the ground in spray paint in a parking lot. To understand that, uh, you have to know that this parking lot was su surrounded by hundreds of empty hotel rooms because tourism had stopped at that time doing, due to COVID. And I share this example because I think it is good to have a common understanding of what it mean when we say poverty is violence. Um, violence is the acceptance of the presumed lack of worth of people in poverty. Um, making the amount of trauma and ill treatment afflicted upon them seem acceptable and commonplace to the point where they are viewed as deserving of it and believed to be somehow responsible for that treatment. Um, just as we saw in the film presented, this experience is universal, regardless of where you live. Um, and it starts with the labeling of people that strips them of their individual identity and it becomes the homeless, the poor, those people, you know? And once you become othered, it's easier, easier to marginalize people, even to the point of believing that they're expendable or disposable. Um, it's a common practice for many in the public to want to avert their eyes when they walk past the person experiencing homelessness, sleeping on the sidewalk as if they don't exist. Um, it's acceptable for police to confiscate and dispose of possessions of people experiencing street homelessness in an effort to make them like move along. 
because they're not considered part of the community anymore. And as Tony was saying, like parents in poverty frequently have their parenting ability questioned and face the fear of having their children taken away by the state because poverty is a synonym for neglect. And that's how it's viewed, that if you were in poverty, it's because you, 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 you are automatically assumed to be neglectful. Um, and all of this weighs on people, creating toxic stress in their body that they live with every day. Um, and it stays with them all the time, as is evident by Michelle and the woman from France and how like Michelle was brought to tears as he was remembering his experience of childhood being taken away from his family and being and how that affected him over time and how the woman from France was saying what she lives with and not wanting to pass that on to her children. Like these, as Tony said, people often think about domestic abuse or physical abuse or anything like as violence, but it goes much deeper than that. So that's my thoughts on that. Yeah, thank you, Marianne. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking of the, the very many layers of violence that we unconsciously participating in, participate in, right? Including our beliefs and our language. And that that's a very rich perspective to work with. Thank you for sharing that. And uh, let's bring in Lenin into the conversation. Lenin, uh, with your work with Marty, you, you work right at the intersection of violence and uh, poverty. So would you like to tell us more uh, and particularly share evidences, examples of where you've seen extreme poverty leading to violence? Lennon, are you muted? Yes, no. Okay. Yes. Yeah, thank you to give me a space to share my experience. I'm in the development sector since 20 years, and I belong to a country where poverty is a big factor. And the country who doesn't have actually the basic social system. So <clears throat> if that system is missing in a society, the poor people are permanently confronted with the mental and physical violence through poverty. So in my work, I actually witness poverty and violence in my regular work. My last visit in December in Bangladesh, I was talking with a mother who was in our primary health care center to ask some medicine for her children. And I knew that mother is already sick. So I was just talking with her for 10 minutes and tried to find out what is the condition. Actually, mother is already sick and that now the son was also sick and they couldn't provide the medicine. So both of them couldn't have medicine for the last seven days. And they were just suffering with the pain and all this together and it's the extraordinary pain for themselves because they were just saving their food money for medicine and try to get more medicine for help of the health care center. So it's the it's the combined mental and physical violence in the whole family. So to realize it, I, I was just shocked again and again that it's the violence not to a person, it's the person, it's the community, it's the, for the whole community. And in my work, I also realized that uh, when we live in a country like Bangladesh, where we have many different classes of people, and in the middle class, in the higher class, we help each other, even we don't have basic social system, health system or so. But in the poor section of the people, they cannot help each other because their families, their neighbors, their relatives are also same status. So they just suffer. They, they suffer every day to save their food and they try to handle the situation. So it's the violence, it's the physical violence, it's the mental violence I observe over the years 
And if these people belong to a small ethnical group or let's say minority people, then the suffer goes more than that. I mean, they themselves and the capture in this society structure. So that's another structural problem which makes more physical violence and mental violence. So I can give you many, many experience about my work uh, with, which is related to this violence, to the poverty. Thank you, Lennon, for starting us off on that note. And uh, for those of us who have questions for any of the panelists, please do please do put them up on chat and we'll uh, take them up as we go along. Uh, and we'll go to the next round of questions for the panelists. And um, so most of uh, us uh, in the audience today are Rotarians and perhaps some of us also represent other civil service, uh, civil society organizations. And our intention in hosting this webinar was to explore how an organization like Rotary can actively participate in mitigating extreme poverty. So with that in mind, uh, let's start with you, Tony. Uh, would you be able to share with us some practical examples of successful interventions that you've been a part of in overcoming uh, the violence of extreme poverty? You can share success stories. You could perhaps also share with us what does not work so that when, let's say, Rotarians design projects, they, they also can factor that in. Uh, yes, um, um, I'll go back to my experience uh, with uh, ATD Fourth World in the Philippines. Um, uh, whenever the full-time volunteers uh, visit the different poor communities, the, the topics of work and money were brought up regularly. Uh, several times, uh, family request the, the team for loans or financial support. Uh, another issue that uh, usually pop up were the dependents, or what they call it five slash six money lenders or loan sharks, uh, because uh, they would ask for 500 pesos, but they have to pay back 600 pesos. That means a 20% interest rate, which was very high, obviously. Um, so over the years, uh, after get, getting to know the families, and gaining their confidence, um, we started to work out what kind of project would be relevant for them. And um, in 2014, uh, we decided to work on a saving program of, um, for very poor families, uh, not with uh, the uh, traditional banks, but uh, not uh, um, uh, micro credit. Um, so what we um, the aim was to provide people, especially those with little or no opportunities for livelihood, an opportunity to learn, to uh, to work, earn, and save together. So the activities were meant to encourage sharing, solidarity, and cooperation. Uh, at the same time to strengthen social ties and develop a sense of common goods within the community. So the whole year of 2014, there was a planning, there were meetings, and it came up with a project to make some money. Of course, you have to have some money before you can save. And then out of the making uh, what I call a Filipino's lantern, and from the saving, they, we helped them create this saving project is called Project Sulong. Uh, what uh, Sulong would mean moving forward. Um, so that's for the adults, for the parents, um, because they have difficulties uh, for them to save. But it, it's, it's a way, it's, it's, there's a need to communicate, to talk to them, understand what they need and get their agreement. And I think that's very important. Um, um, over the Looking at the chat, some of you mentioned education, and uh, we strongly believe that education is very vital for uh, the families in very poor communities. And uh, the difficulty of getting a good 
education because they do not have basic background. So we also started uh, another project, which uh, is to build up the self confidence of children who fall behind in traditional schooling because they cannot read nor write. So, and also uh, we make use of some of the parents as the first educator of these children. And these parents are therefore an integral partners in this project. It's important to include people in the community. And I think that uh, has been going on and um, the parents were very he helpful. They were the facilitators and they were the facilitators um, uh, during the pandemic because they were the only persons allowed in the community. We, the, uh, as uh, foreigners and also as outsiders, we were not allowed into the community because of the lockdown. So the, 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 the parents were again, were we able to co continue some of the projects. I think that's uh, maybe just, uh, yeah two of the examples let's share with you thank you tony and uh, yeah if, uh, what i hear you say is really look at poverty from a whole systems perspective and bring in all stakeholders involved in a way that the solution is sustainable uh, marianne i uh, would love to hear from you given that your research has spanned several countries what uh, kind of projects do you see are successful interventions and what does not work? Um, and they ask me about projects and I, the best projects I always believe are the ones that are conducted in partnership with people. Um, but I also think before that you need, before you even begin that there needs to be some prerequisites. Um, for example, there needs to be mutuality. You know, some time ago, I said to a colleague of, of mine that my fellow coordinator for the MAP research project, um, you know, when we were talking about policies and best practices, and I said to him, like, I can't begin to talk about policy to eradicate poverty when all of my time is spent defend, define, defending my existence, you know, convincing people that I'm worthy of dignity and humanity simply because I am human, you know? Um, society has been conditioned to see people in poverty as the problem, you know, instead of the policy, the programs, or the systems that trap them in poverty as the problem, because we have been accustomed to seeing only the deficiencies in people instead of their humanity. So mutuality is a must, but that also means we need to stop seeing people in poverty only as data points, you know, to be studied and analyzed. Um, when people are dehumanized and seen only as numbers on a spreadsheet, it becomes that much easier to marginalize them. Um, people in poverty do have a voice and they do have agency, but the problem is they're often not listened to or they're ignored. You know, so I would say another prerequisite is that when they tell you their truth, believe them what they say. Um, and when they say, tell you their truth, don't instrumentalize or weapon their trauma against them, which is often done as we heard in the video. Um, I would say eliminate paternalistic programs, you know, by asking people what are their needs, you know, because people in poverty, I believe, and I always say is I find to be true, know how policies and programs and best practices work in actuality opposed to how it's supposed to be working on paper you know um very important is to learn to share the space learn to share the power and most importantly listen and then work in equal partnership with people you know to make those needs become a reality you know so i'll say for a quick recap you know Mutuality, um, believe in people's truths. Don't instrumentalize their trauma, you know? Don't engage in paternalistic practices. Share the space and working in partnership. Because once you have that and you realize this is what needs to be done, there's prerequisites going into a project, opposed to telling people what you think they need, 
you'll be able to see people as people, not as the problem, not a problem that needs to be solved because they can tell you from their own experiences and you listen to them and programs develop from there. As Tony said, we was working with people, but they said, we, they, you know, we need to create this project so they can be better served or they needed to be educated. So we were teaching people how to read it and educate themselves. If you listen to people, they'll share their stories and that'll lead the agenda of the programs that need to be created. So thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Marianne. It's, it's so critical to humanize the process and not really look at it as a statistical exercise in reducing the numbers, right? So thank you for saying that. Uh, Lenin, you've had very rich experience in actually designing and implementing interventions around poverty. So would you want to cite some examples of success stories that you've uh, managed and experienced and also, in case there are stories where things didn't quite work out the way you thought they would. Thank you, Rukmini. Um, I will rather, yes, of course, we know that over the past years, we have good examples of projects and uh, worldwide, but we must admit also that there is a lot of black figures of presenting the uh, good practice project because we don't admit sometimes that our mistakes in the process implementation. Actually, what I want to mention is here rather what doesn't work actually uh, in terms of achieving project positively. If if we really go with our arrogant uh, arrogant thinking of putting the project top to bottom strategy, which is still a big discussion in the development sector, but we don't admit it that donors, decision makers, elite of our society, elite of our world, we still want to dominate our ideas uh, and design our projects in that way. So I, I want to say that here we have to be very carefully how to include people living in poverty and design projects together. And this doesn't happen, actually. And it's a big discussion over the last 10, 20 years, but still we follow the same way of top to bottom approach. So I can give you some example, a very small example of my city in my main thing that suddenly a big project came from GIZ and government together and they wanted to make a um, local community-based committee and um, they, instead of looking into the existing committees in the society, they just divide the whole city in different clusters and each cluster has to have Let's say 10 committee. And you break, break down first the existing structure and make the new, new committee, which was planned as they wanted to do it. So, in the end, it doesn't work. I mean, it was just a period of two years' time that the project was implemented and they built up this, those committees. And in the end, it was not working. So I just want to say in the end again that we have to come down from our arrogant way of working in the poverty sector with the people. So we have to include the people. We have to include and design the program together. That, that is the future. Thank you. Thank you, Lenin. And in a way, what you said also underlines what ATD stands for in terms of bringing in the dignity in the process of alleviating poverty. Uh, we have some questions uh, on chat and uh, let's start taking them up. Uh, uh, this question uh, seems to be directed at ATD, to, so perhaps Tony or Marianne, you could take this up. Uh, uh, someone in the audience is curious about, uh, are, are you doing any pilot projects in any countries that you've researched 
uh, in a manner, in a systematic or an organized manner, which can be used as a template by Rotarians to replicate a project. Um, yes. Um, earlier on, uh, Marianne was mentioning the uh, participative uh, research project on the multi dimensional aspect of poverty. It was done in partnership with uh, Oxford University. And um, of course, uh, it's uh, at the tertiary level. There, are, there is a scientific research. So um, there are certain very stringent criteria um, to be met. So um, this is, uh, there's a process of, uh, of the findings. So um, maybe Marianne can mention more. And also in, um, in, in here in France, um, uh, we're also working with different universities of, and in partnership with different university as well as um, people living in poverty, uh, the academics, repeat the activists, and also people in common life. Uh, get getting together on tackling the issue of poverty on different issues on education, on health, um, because um, the poor, uh, th those people living in poverty, um, through the experience, um, um, they provide um, their knowledge, which uh, sometimes it's um, very different from what the academics or what other people are thinking. So it's a long process. Uh, it requires um, uh, patience and sometimes conflicts. But uh, if you want to have a sustainable development, then we must work together with very poor people uh, with their rich experience. Um, the one thing I want to say about the research that was done, um, it was done using the merging of knowledge methodology, which was created by ATD Fourth World over 20 years ago. And it brings together people with lived experience of poverty and academics and practitioners to combine. And that's how we came up with the dimensions by the different experiences and putting it together. And the programs that, one of the programs that developed out of that in the United States was um, a co-training co for social worker students. By listening to the people that were in the research, you know, telling about their experience, negative experiences that they've had in, with dealing with social workers or social services, um, it was decided that maybe, we, you know, fo again, following the lead of people, what they see they need as a program, um, this was developed and it's run out of New York City and it's actually people, we have sat in and facilitated a couple of classes at the new school um, with incorporation with the Office of Equity for Children. And we've actually have given a class presentation to a policy class at Fordham. So there is partnerships and programs that are developing out of it. Thank you. We've got a few more questions. I'm going to start with uh, uh, what looks like the broadest of them all, which is around, uh, do we have an agreed uh, definition and identification of causes for what, you know, what leads to extreme poverty? And any of you could take this up, Tony, Marianne, Lennon. What constitutes extreme poverty and what leads to it? Um, it's difficult. I mean, um, we can we know that the definition of poverty is the one one is uh, like UN definition and World Bank definition and World Health Organization definition. Mm -hmm. That's that's what we know all 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 of us we know. But it's more than that. It's more than that, and that that's what actually our merging of knowledge methodology brings this Oxford study together that the dimension of poverty is much more than that. 
So we shouldn't stuck actually very narrow definition of US dollar, that much US dollar or so that much calories we need for our body is much more than that. So I think it's a big question. I mean, many time to require to discuss this, but I will suggest just to see uh, ATD website and see the dimension of poverty. And uh, Mati was part of it, Bangladesh. So we got nine dimensions of poverty. So all of them are relevant for to define poverty. Yeah, in the US, we also came up with nine dimensions of poverty and we came up with what we call constants and aggravators, the things that are always there and present in, ex in the experience of poverty and the things that can exasperate it and make it worse for people, um, like social identity, time, the amount that you import and how you're perceived. Um, but the one thing that we recognize that we talked about what leads or causes it, or more so what needs to be present was subjugation the idea in, of power and how some groups wield power over the others and determines who has access to resources who doesn't have access and so that was the one thing that we looked at as in the united states because each country had their own dimensions and then there was combined for international list of dimensions um we talked about it as subjugation is it which is what causes it and leads to it that needs to be in place firsthand Yes, um, Lennon and Marianne mentioned that uh, poverty is definitely uh, multidimensional. There's so many aspects. Uh, looking at, going back to the video again, you say, what, what does it feel? How to feel human again? I want to feel human. How, how do we measure that um, the social maltreatment by social services or we, very often we think that um, it's, it's, it's a monetary problem. Uh, it is. We need to put in money to help them, but it's not enough when um, they are, the, the dignity there is not uh, addressed. Um, the pain of a single mother uh, uh, being looked down upon by the community, how, how do we address that? It's, it's, it's very complex. And um, uh, we should all just be aware of it and uh, do it very slowly. So uh, for Rotarians, um, um, maybe uh, some of you are, I'm sure, are involved in projects, um, but there are very simple projects around the world. Uh, there are many NGOs who are doing excellent projects. Um, Mati is doing a great job in Bangladesh, and I'm sure there are thousands over. And, to work with them, but to, like Lennon was saying, these communities, the, the families, they are living it, um, we should at least take time to listen to them. Um, very often, we, of course, we know the famous uh, teach a man to fish, uh, the process, but should, um, we are so concerned, so occupied by teaching people that very often we forget to listen, taking time to listen, we are there just to teach, but not to learn. I think that's very important to listen and to learn from what these people who are living extreme poverty are saying to us. Yes, thank you. And what you say is so critical, Tony, because otherwise in the process of trying to mitigate or add to the solution, we end up adding to the violence of it by not listening and going in, in a state where we create different power dynamics. So thank you for naming that. Uh, there, there's a question around the linkage between food security and uh, uh, poverty. And uh, uh, someone's curious about, are there programs which specifically address this aspect of poverty and how can Rotary perhaps uh, support some of these organizations? So would any of you have recommendations on organizations that work in this context? Um, well, there are, in, during the pandemic, uh, well, it's happening now, um, most of the projects 
uh, around the world uh, have been uh, 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 halted. And uh, that's uh, we are, a lot of uh, our fellow volunteers are looking at ways to summon them how to f provide um, emergency food. But there are also um, very um, other organizations who are, who are doing that. I'm sure <laughs> they are through, uh, through internet, we can find them. So um, um, myself, um, I'm actually stuck here. So at the moment, um, and trying to get in touch with my fellow teams uh, in Asia. Uh, the, uh, so I I'm sure through the internet, uh, there are very helpful uh, websites that you can find. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, John. Um, there are several questions around uh, challenging the economic system as it is, and how do we, you know, uh, in a way, influence the economic system to focus on humanity, perhaps to humanize the system in a way that economic growth is sustainable. And uh, while while that's a broad question in terms of how do we get to do that, how do we, what are the measures that we can, we as Rotarians or civil society can start taking to influence economic systems? Uh, the, any comments uh, by any of you on that? What, what is it that we can do on the ground so that the economic system eventually becomes more human? Well, the, the, the economic system, uh, we have been trying to organize alternative economic systems. Um, uh, more um, eco-friendly, uh, looking at climate change, which affects very poor communities around the world. Uh, rising uh, water areas get flooded and um, uh, looking around, they are at different levels. Uh, you Rotarians are involved, I'm sure, at different levels in society. Um, we ATD also have to work at different levels. Uh, I myself was, was working at the United Nation, uh, trying to change international law. And um, in 2012, um, the Human Rights Council uh, adopted the uh, 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 guiding principle on extreme poverty and human rights. So they recognize that extreme poverty is a violation of human rights. So that's the international level. And um, we can, if you have any um, context at that level, try to influence um, states to apply those principles. Um, uh, it has just been adopted. It will go a long way, just like the Declaration of Human Rights. <laughs> That was so many years ago, and yet still we are violating the basic fundamental human rights. And also um, international multinationals um, um, seeing that uh, how children are abused in certain countries, and that can be uh, a possibility for Rotarians also. And um, getting to be more aware of climate change that are affecting very poor families. They are the first victims, as usual, of this uh, extreme climate uh, weather. Uh, I'm sure Bangladesh, um, they have good examples. Uh, well, I think um, many countries. So um, you have to look, I think personally, um, you, what free time uh, um, and also what at what capacity you can offer. Maybe in the, it's just a neighborhood doing simple street libraries or through educations, um, helping children who have no access to the internet at the moment, because that's one of our main challenges at the moment. How do we get children who are in lockdown situation to gain access to an education uh, instead of just sitting in front of the television. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Tony. And uh, 
we'll be coming towards the end of time so uh, we, we will have to bring the conversation to a close here but uh, if all of us here are left with more questions than answers then mm -hmm. i would think this is a successful webinar because that that's the point of this conversation about how do we get disturbed about extreme poverty in the world and what do we do about that disturbance in our privilege as Rotarians and as uh, people representing various other civil society organizations. So uh, Tony, Marianne, Lennon, thank you so much for your perspectives and for the work that you do in the world. And uh, thank you everyone for engaging, for, for your questions and for the very rich conversation on the chat we we will of course compile the chat messages and mail that across to everyone who's attended today because there are a fair bit of resources that have been shared by all of you so uh, we'll certainly send that out to you and uh, with that let me hand it back to quentin to close the session um, thank you uh, mini and thank you all for participating we we had about uh, 160 170 registrations and about a third of those uh, or more uh, came to the meeting um, we will make the recording available uh, we will actually prepare as i mentioned it in the chat uh, some kind of package uh, with uh, several resources uh, mentioned in the chat but also uh, links uh, for example to the study that was mentioned by atd um, on the dimensions of poverty and other materials. Um, thank you again to everybody. Um, what we will especially try to do um, is also uh, dedicate uh, web pages uh, in the new websites for uh, the Rotary Fellowship for Global Development and the RAG uh, on Refugees, um, IDPs and Migration about uh, what this kind of information means for a Rotary Club. Uh, there was a question, what do we do for global grants? Global grants is one aspect. Um, but actually, um, there is also uh, a lot of things that Rotary Clubs uh, can do, uh, independently of global grants at a smaller level, uh, making the issue of extreme poverty better understood, for example, by members of Rotary. Uh, you could show uh, the video that we shared today. Uh, there are actually different versions of that video, some shorter, some longer, uh, in a Rotary Club meeting. Uh, you could uh, do smaller projects. So again, thank you, everybody. Uh, we want to make sure that we finish by... Is that is a high? I'm sorry? So I don't know. Uh, somebody was uh, saying something. So thank you, everybody. Um, uh, Spencer, I don't know if there is anything uh, that you want to add um, on your side. Um, but on my side, just uh, again, thank you for attending. And we will make um, uh, quite a few uh, resources available in a follow-up um, email. Spencer, anything on your side? Yes, um, on behalf of the um, Rotary Peace Fellowships uh, Association, I thank all the Rotarians for your sponsorships in all the events. And more importantly, of course, is the uh, supporting of the Rotary Peace Centers. Without your support in this area, that we would not be having this kind of events supported by the, the different uh, Rotary Peace Fellows worldwide. And we are planning to be have more events on these online things on a monthly basis. And coming along that, we are holding the, um, the next Global Sci Conference. We're looking forward again to all the Rotander to continue the support in our uh, peace building movement. Thank you, Quentin, and thank you for all the panelists and the, uh, the Rotarians attending the, the meetings. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank <laughs> you for having us. Yes. It was wonderful being with you today and for doing such a great job hosting Rakmini and Quentin and Spencer. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care and enjoy your weekend. Bye-bye, <laughs> everybody. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.